Greetings, friends. My name is Pavel Stelemuch, and now we will dive into the top news of this day. Ukrainian delegation in North America. Prime Minister Denis Shmihal has already held meetings in Canada and plans to go to the USA. In Canada, productive meetings were held with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, Deputy Prime Minister Christina Freeland, heads of the Canadian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Defence, representatives of Canadian business and pension funds. As Shmihal noted, we are attracting as much support as possible for our victory, reconstruction and post-war development of Ukraine. The following important issue is military aid to Ukraine, and I want to emphasize this in order to defend itself and liberate our occupied territories. We are grateful to the government of Canada for joining the Leopard Coalition. We also hope to increase supplies of heavy weapons, including tanks, armored vehicles and ammunition. We also discussed this issue with the Prime Minister and government members today. During the visit in Canada, the countries agreed that the free trade agreement would be renewed. Shmihal signed a declaration on the completion of negotiations with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, a significant agreement that opens new opportunities for business and for the creation of production facilities in Ukraine. We have prospects for the implementation of profitable projects in the agricultural sector, military industry, IT and energy. In particular, we are planning to build new nuclear power units, and Canadian companies can play a key role here, said Shmihal. Also during visit, Energa Atom concluded an agreement with the Canadian energy company, which became the final stage of the implementation of the program for the use of Ukrainian uranium in the production of nuclear fuel for NPPs of Ukraine. Canadian entrepreneurs are interested in investing in Ukraine. Our companies already cooperate with Canadian partners and are ready to deepen cooperation. But the most important thing is, of course, military aid. Canada has been helping Ukrainians defend themselves by sending military assistance, including tanks and armored vehicles, ammunition, weapons and other equipment. Today, we're announcing we'll be sending even more weapons. Sourced from Colt Canada, We'll be sending 21,000 assault rifles, 38 machine guns, and over 2.4 million rounds of ammunition. This will help the armed forces of Ukraine continue to defend their freedom and fight for Ukraine's territorial integrity. In addition, Canada introduced another package of sanctions against Russian legal entities and individuals, in particular, Volga Dnieper Company, whose an 124 aircraft was blocked in Canada, came under sanctions. The next step is the confiscation of Ruslan and other assets and their transfer to Ukraine. We also discussed the issue of the participation of Canadian companies in the post-war reconstruction of Ukraine. It will be the largest project in Europe since World War II. According to World Bank estimates, today we are talking about $411 billion of destruction and losses that Russia has caused to Ukraine. And accordingly, these are funds that are needed only to restore the relevant infrastructure in the housing, transport and energy sectors and demining agricultural territories. After a few days in Canada, the Ukrainian delegation will hold several meetings in the United States. It is announced that Denis Mihal will discuss the post-war reconstruction of Ukraine there. The Kremlin Myrmidon, the so-called head of Crimea, Sergei Aksyonov, boasted of the modern echelon defense of the Russian army on the annexed peninsula and said that Ukraine's counteroffensive does not frighten the occupiers. They are supposedly ready for this, and there will be no military catastrophe. Of course, there will be no catastrophe, because it will not be a disaster when the territory of the peninsula returns under Ukrainian control. As it is written in all international documents, which Russia has been violating for more than nine years, someone like the president of Brazil, Da Silva, can assume that Kyiv can give for the sake of achieving peace. Well, I have a counteroffer. Give Brazil to Putin to end the war. Sounds weird, right? So why can a Brazilian politician afford such praises? Crimea is an integral part of Ukraine, which is confirmed by international law. Ukraine does not trade its territories and citizens with the aggressor. 
In 2014, the Russian Federation annexed the Ukrainian peninsula through aggression and violent suppression of the rights of the local population. The so-called referendum was a propaganda show that had nothing to do with real expression of will. Russia still implements a harsh occupation regime in Crimea, plunders and colonizes the peninsula. After the occupation of Crimea, from eight to 500,000 citizens of the Russian Federation moved there illegally. And as the permanent representative of the president of Ukraine in Crimea, Tamila Tashova said, after the deoccupation of peninsula, they will all return home to Russia. Our citizens who have been living in Crimea since 2014, even if they received an occupational illegal passport, we will not prosecute them just for the fact of living in the territory of Crimea and obtaining a passport. Because according to Ukrainian law, this is not a crime. All the documents that were issued on the territory of Crimea are worthless. We do not recognize them. Therefore, to persecute for what we do not recognize, the fact of the existence of such a document, is simply absurd. Therefore, our citizens should not be afraid of the return of Crimea under the control of Ukraine. We respect international law, human rights, the rule of law. Only those people who actively contributed to the occupation regime, violated human rights, war crimes, genocide were carried out on the territory of the peninsula by those who made ruling decisions, top officials, those who swore in oath, judges, prosecutors, investigators, military. Everyone else has nothing to fear. Moreover, according to the chairman of the Majlis of the Crimean Tatar people, Rifat Chubarov, the leadership of the Russian military and the local so-called authorities are already evacuating their family members from the peninsula, as they understand that it will not be possible to hold Ukrainian territory. The commanding staff, this applies to both the armed force of the Russian Federation and the leadership of the parent bodies of Russia in the Crimea. They, as a rule, have decided with their families. Many have already evacuated their family members, so they know more. Despite all this demonstration of the huge scale of ratification being built, professionals in the occupying administration and the occupying Russian army, they realized that it will not be possible to keep the Crimea. And the Russians have something to fear. The reason of explosions in Crimea has already begun. They are gradually realizing that wherever Ukraine is, they will not have peace. Ukrainian fighters are liquidating the capacities of the Russian army, warehouses, accumulations of equipment, places of deployment of personnel, said the spokesperson of the Southern Defense Forces, Natalia Humanyuk. And we must liberate Crimea because the peninsula is a base for the expansion of Russian aggression. This is what happened in 2022, and this will happen until Russia leaves the peninsula. Evil, humiliation, repression, murders, war now reign on the land of Crimea under the Russian tricolor. But where the path of evil began, it is there that I am sure victory awaits us, victory over this evil. The deoccupation of Crimea is uncontested not only for Ukraine, but for the whole world, and I am sure of it. Yes, we are ready for various options for the deoccupation of Crimea, because we believe in our soldiers and armed forces, but I think that no one will be against if the peninsula will be returned by diplomatic means. The Russian Federation Council has approved a unified register of conscripts. One vote against. Yesterday, the State Duma of the Russian Federation approved the new rules for conscription in Russia, now only Putin's signature separates the Russians from military terror in the country. Now the country will have a common electronic database of recruits, information to which will be required to be entered by the Federal Tax Service, investigating authorities, courts, pension fund, medical organizations, universities and other organizations. Summons will be officially sent by registered mail and through the Rosusugi. This is an electronic resource of public services in Russia, an electronic summons considered to be delivered from the moment it is posted in the citizen's personal account. Also, the summons is considered served after seven days from the date of its placement in the register of summons. In fact, this means that there will be no chance to avoid receiving the summons. Citizens who are subject to conscription and who have received a summons from the military commissariat are prohibited from leaving the Russian Federation, 
from the day such a summons is considered to have been served. The decision on this provisional measure will be made automatically. Within a day from the date of delivery, the draftee will be sent a warning that he is prohibited from leaving the country. If within 20 days after the date specified in the agenda, the conscript does not appear at the military registration and enlistment office, he will be prohibited from registering individual entrepreneurs and self-employment, registering real estate and vehicles, driving vehicles and obtaining loans. Military registration will be carried out without appearing at the commissariat. That is, the authorities twist people's hands and the population endures. Interestingly, conscription in Russia began on April 1st, and new rules will be in effect already this spring. The Russians have a month or two left until the bureaucratic apparatus swings in order to escape from the war. Those who have left cannot return. Everything will end up being sent to war or to prison. By adopting a law on electronic saponers, the authorities are trying to solve two main tasks to create conditions for simplifying the recruitment of Russians for the war and to launch a campaign to force those who left with the start of partial mobilization to return to the Russian Federation. Those who left will try to convince them to return. Those who believe and return will eventually be neutralized as unreliable through mobilization, prison, physical destruction. This is what the Soviet government did. The law on electronic summons significantly expands the authorities' abilities to recruit Russians into the army. The law is potentially unpopular, but the authorities proceed from the fact that the population would not be able to resist. It will continue to silently endure attacks on its rights after the new reality in matters of forcing Russians to perform military duties becomes the norm. The authorities will continue to attack the rights and opportunities for Russians. For those who left the country during the first wave of mobilization were given a tough choice, either to return and accept the conditions of power or to apply for political asylum. An additional motive for the new law is the introduction under the guise of refugees seeking political asylum of Russian agents and spies into Western countries. The new law marks the transition to the final dropping of masks. The authorities will be more and more persistent in tightening the screws and forcing Russians to participate in the war against Ukraine. That concludes our today's video. Thank you for staying with us and stay tuned for future videos. Goodbye.